Good morning. So today we are with Margaret Richardson, Chief of Staff at DevEx. A little bit of background on Margaret. So she was raised by two educators. It was fair to say that Margaret's first classroom was around the dinner table with the international students who lived with her family. This experience helped her understand the concerns of those impacted by global development firsthand and eventually led her to live abroad in Europe and the Middle East. In addition to spending time studying the refugee crisis in Jordan and teaching English in Palestine, Margaret brings with her professional experience working on Capitol Hill with nonprofits, public foundations, and congressional campaigns. As someone keenly interested in storytelling, Margaret is a strategic communicator, organizer, and problem solver whose daily tasks focus on working with Raj, who is the CEO of DevEx, to take DevEx to the next level. Thanks so much for joining us, Margaret. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. So let's just dive right in. I'd love to learn a little bit more about your background and obviously journey to the chief of staff role. We heard a little bit of it through your bio in terms of your upbringing and being around a lot of different cultures and storytelling and obviously growing up abroad. But I'd love to learn a little bit more about what you were doing before the chief of staff role professionally and how you ultimately ended up at DevEx. Yeah, sure. So during college, I always was interested in domestic policy, but specifically international policies. And so I spent a lot of time interning for my state senators. I interned for Senator Snow and Senator Collins. And then when Senator Angus King was running for the seat in Maine, I thought that joining a campaign would be really interesting. So I did that one summer. And after college, I came down to D.C. to work work for him. And I really thought public service would really be the area that I would pursue after school. But as you said, I had grown up with a lot of different kids joining us around the dinner table. And specifically, there was one kid who really had an impact on me, and he had grown up in, in Palestine. So I spent a summer teaching English with his mom after my time abroad in Jordan. And, and while I was on the Hill, I just kept thinking about the international development community. And I just found myself being drawn to that work and, and wanting to read more and more about it. So. When it came time to look for a new role, I was immediately sort of drawn into this industry and and wanted to look at places here. But I also knew that I loved the campaign life, that Mm -hmm. fast-paced kind of startup feel. So I was looking for not just any job or any role. I really wanted one that would harken back to the campaign days. And so how did you hear about DevEx? Were you just searching around for chief of staff roles in D.C.? Or was it a specific introduction? Or how did you land across DevEx? So I actually didn't really consider the chief of staff role ever when I was initially looking. But again, I knew I wanted to work for one that was doing something innovative or different within an industry that was very traditional. Obviously, the Hill is a very traditional place. And I just, I just felt like I wanted to explore technology a little bit more and, and that side of things. So honestly, I was just looking around on different websites and I actually found this job on the DevX job board. One of the things we have is a pretty extensive job board for anyone looking for jobs in international development. And I found the special assistant to the president role and reading the job description was like unlike any other job description I had ever read. So I threw my hat in the ring. And when you first went into DevEx and you met with Raj and you started talking about specifically what the role was going to look like. Were you confident that you were the one that was supposed to be in this role or did it take some time to figure out if this is something that you wanted for yourself or was there an immediate connection? How did that initial conversation go? That's a great question. So I actually met Raj's colleague first at sort of a pre-interview and I immediately connected with her. She was, you know, the type of female role model that people, I think, talk about as kind of a dream role model. She was, you know, incredibly intelligent. And -hmm. and I just felt like I really connected with her. And and hearing about the company sort of at large, I, I just felt, oh, like this is a really interesting place. And what they're trying to do within the industry is really interesting. I'd like to learn more. And then when I did finally talk to Raj, you know, it was really his vision for the company where he saw that I an impact in the global development industry and where he saw the global development industry going. That was really compelling. But what really sucked me in was just his 
interest in growing the role. I mean, sort of the combination of where he saw the industry going, where he saw the company going, and then mm-hmm. his dreams for the role as the role grew. I, I, you know, sort of 30 minutes into the conversation, I was, mm-hmm. I was totally bought in and ready to go. And then I met the rest of the team and, and you know, this place attracts some of the best and brightest people in the industry. So mm-hmm. I, I knew I would be very lucky to be able to be a part of it. So tell us a little bit more about DevEx. It sounds like it's been an exciting opportunity for you and obviously has a really strong mission and like you said, team. And so you guys must be working on a lot of interesting things. And I want to make sure that everybody who's listening gets an opportunity to learn a little bit more about what you guys specifically do and have done over the last couple of years. Sure. So DevEx is the media platform for the global development community. So a very, very easy and sort of simple way to think about us is if what Bloomberg does for finance, we do for the global development industry. And the global development industry can be defined as anybody doing global good, which sounds very broad, but think World Bank, UN, the IMF, Gates Foundation, Rockefeller Ford, the big sort of global philanthropy foundations. And then, you know, increasingly and, and very excitingly, a lot of big corporations, tech companies, organizations that are starting to become a lot more involved in what we would call traditional global development work. And then, of course, you know, USA is different and then some of the more traditional donors. So when I started, and one of the things Raj talked a lot about in our interview was how the global development industry was changing and how, you know, technology, innovation, billionaire philanthropy, how those things were really shifting the way that aid was being done and how, you know, we were really just thinking about how to partner with different organizations, how to use and leverage technology to start really serving the communities that we've been trying to serve for a long time and been doing a good job of, but that, you know, we could really accelerate progress if we were paying attention and and Mm -hmm. using the tools that we have in different ways. So, you know, we're sort of in this moment in time in international development that is really exciting. And and what DevEx does is try to serve that entire community. So we Mm -hmm. have, as I said, we have a job board that we post a lot of jobs to, but we also have an entire media side. So we have editors, reporters, analysts all over the world who Mm -hmm. are going out and looking at what's happening on the ground and reporting back to the community about, you know, what's working, what's not working. We also have a partnerships and events line where we talk about where we do events or big communication campaigns on specific subjects that we think really need to be highlighted or, or brought to the forefront of the community. And, and, and basically, you know, what our role is, is to serve those who are doing some of the most important work in the world. And it's a big privilege to be able to do that. It's exciting work, and, and we're allowed to do a lot of different things because of our, of our sort of speed in the intersection of all of it. Yeah, you know what's really interesting as I hear you talk about the things that you guys are up to, which is really important work, is in a lot of ways you guys are at the intersection between tech and media and also just the development space generally where you're providing and coalescing all the information and the latest news of what's really happening in the space and saying back to the the clients or the people that you're working with, like, this is what you should know and this is what you should keep an eye on. And in it kind of likens the chief of staff role where you're an advisor and a partner to the principal or the CEO in most cases of saying these are the top things that you should know about what's going on within our company, within, within our industry. And I know that you've had, you had experience in doing that before this specific role, but this is a little bit different. And it's also a media company and there's a tech play. And so how did you bring yourself up to speed in the first maybe six months or so in being able to feel confident in what you were advising Raj in the early days or setting up a set of structures and information gathering that you were telling and and informing him of the right issues and topics that he really needed to be concerned with. Because I know a lot of chiefs of staff in the beginning six months, it can be so hard because you're juggling gaining the trust of the principal, bringing yourself up to speed on the organization, and then really understanding what your role and set of responsibilities are. So how did you juggle all of that? And how did you kind of bring yourself up to speed on what was happening in the development space? So I think it's important to note that I started as the special assistant to the president and editor-in-chief, which is Raj's title. And so I spent the first year at DevEx really doing a lot of admin work. I served as the office manager. I mm-hmm. kind of was a catch-all for our office in D.C. We, we have three different offices, but really the D.C. office is, is, is sort of where a lot of the a lot of the teams and a lot of the executives sit. So I had access 
through the admin role and through the office manager role to a lot of different parts of the company. And that we, you know, there's a sort of like HR function as well. And so I think I had about a year to really get my feet wet and learn a lot about the company and the industry and the organizations that were really key players in our world before I became chief of staff. And I think my ability to do the admin work or the basic tools of the, of the job really well is, is something that helped Raj and I build a relationship. But I think, you know, something that I did very naturally and I think is one of the reasons I'm successful as a chief of staff is I always am very interested in, in the people that are working with me. I spend a lot of time talking to people and I just continue to do that to this day, whether even if it means I need to work a couple hours later or, you know, I have to be late to a meeting. I, I think it's really important to learn from everyone what they're working on, what's important to them, what they're thinking about, what's on their minds. And my ability to do that, to do that and to, to understand how that information is important to Raj, I think it's one of the things that makes mm-hmm. me successful and makes any chief of staff successful. But I also think, you know, kind of nailing down the details and being able to do things really well and efficiently so that you have time to do that is, is pretty key mm-hmm. as well. So by the time I stepped into the chief of staff role, I had a base of knowledge that I think was very key. It sounds like you were able to dial into a lot of different team members and get a lot of crucial information very quickly and be able to develop those relationships and become a trusted partner to not just Raj, but also other stakeholders within the organization. So I think one one piece of DevEx and how you guys operate as a team that's always been really interesting to me is kind of measuring success as well as accountability. And I remember we were having a conversation about how you specifically view performance reviews. You know, a lot of chiefs of staff are like, you know, we have performance reviews at our company and sometimes we don't. But the whole point is, how do we measure our success? And sometimes that can be very vague and ambiguous because of the fact that, you know, there may not be specific things that as a chief of staff, you can really point to as success, whether it's growing the revenue or specific tactical and tangible things that you can point to. I think a lot of chiefs of staff really struggle with that because we're all inherently doers and we want to be able to say that we made progress in specific areas. But I'd love to learn a little bit more about how you and at DevEx really think about performance, measuring success, and just overall accountability. I agree. This is something that I've talked to a lot of chiefs of staff about. It's something they struggle with. I think anybody who is working really closely with someone else to help make them or the company or their goals really successful, especially women, you know, have a hard time claiming, you know, sort of something as their own, as their own success. And that's something DevEx talks a lot about when it comes to performance reviews. How do we make sure that everybody, not Mm -hmm. just the loudest voices, are being heard and being recognized? So something that we do is we use a tool that allows us to do very many small performance reviews every two months. And that's something that we know sounds like a lot, but it actually helps us track performance and track goals really well. And these are questions that are aimed at not only assessing, you, you assess your own performance and your immediate team lead assesses your performance, but you also assess their performance. So the mm-hmm. reason we think that's really important is because there is a difference between management and coaching at DevEx. There, you know, the management is kind of the day-to-day tasks. And that, I think, that management piece, I think, is where we, we think a lot about accountability. You know, has the project gotten done? Did we hit our numbers this month? That, that's that piece. But then there's coaching, and coaching is, is very different. It's a, more of a knowledge transfer. It focuses a little bit more on the entire person and the entire professional. And so we do that every two months. And that's something that, especially for Raj and I, I think is really key to our relationship because we're on the move quite often. And at at any given time, I've got 10 or 20 things I need to talk to him about. So the ability to take some time and step back and, and hear from him, you know, this is this is where big picture, I can see you improve or I see that you've done really well has been has been really important to thinking about my performance and my, my growth. And, and what I love is that we have the ability to coach each other. So every team lead at DevEx gets to do it as well or gets a coaching performance review from their team as well. So they get to learn a lot about their own management style. I think that's really important because it shouldn't always be top down. And then in terms of accountability specific to my role, you know, Raj and I have our own metrics that we need to hit. 
internally, whether they're CD goals or if we're doing a project together, you know, sort of closing it out or working with a client on something. We have those sort of specific goals, but then we have other internal goals where perhaps we're trying to move the needle on a aspect of our culture or we're trying to build out a new diversity and inclusion plan. There's, you know, there's a number of things that we do there. So I think, you know, the way I think about it is in quarters, of course, like what do we want to make sure that we're really hitting this quarter and how do we prioritize our time to ensure that we're doing that. And you think that every two month cadence is important because it allows for you to break up obviously the quarter and, and really thinking about your goals, both short term and long term, but it also facilitates just more of an open conversation, right? Where people know that this two month review cycle is happening. So it allows for more fluidity, more openness, would you say? Or how do you think that those conversations help with culture? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and part of my portfolio is to think about the people and the culture at DevX. I think two months is the right cadence because it is a longer questionnaire that you have to fill out. We hope that people are thoughtful and I think every month would be a lot. So two months, I think, allows for pro- real progress to be made on projects and it also allows for people to improve upon things that perhaps were mentioned previously. But I also think it does ensure that you don't ever go too long without getting real coaching about your own performance and your own sort of path or professionalism within the organization. And I think that's really important. And I personally believe that it's helped a lot in our culture. There is, of course, you know, kind of a, a moment where everyone's like, oh, yeah, we have to we have to do this now. It's, it's yeah. time to fill these things out. And it does take time. You know, it's not easy to get everybody on board. But those who participate every, every time and those who do find real value in this, I think, have said it's brought them and their team members closer and there are some bigger teams you know on our on our news side obviously our editor there she has a much larger team we have a huge team of reporters so we we adjust the cadence if we need to for some of the larger teams but those are also teams that we ensure are getting regular feedback or coaching in other ways and obviously as you can imagine an editor reporter relationship does that but yeah, I think that coaching piece is really important because we are a small social enterprise. We are all very busy, hardworking yeah. individuals. I think more and more you see companies like that. And so taking that time to give coaching versus management is truly key. And I think builds a lot of community, both within your team, but as a company at large. When did you guys implement this type of programming? The software, the tool that you're using right now, you guys are almost 200 people. Is that right? We're about 140, actually, but we're, we're, we'll be 200 maybe in a couple of years. And when did you guys start using a tool like this? That's a good question. We must have started using it about two, two and a half years ago. Yeah, so pretty early on. Yeah, so we, we got to a point in time where there was a lot of interest in getting more regular feedback, both as professionals, but also giving it to the, the entire company. So we implemented two software tools that one, this like feedback one called small improvements. And that was just to make sure that as our teams grew globally, and we, we grew a lot globally, we now have people working from different development hubs all over the world, that we were always getting that regular feedback. It's pretty easy to give someone regular coaching when they're in the same office, but when you're working with 140 people globally, it's a little bit harder. So we implemented that to ensure that was happening. And then the other one, the other tool we implemented is called Office Vibe, and that surveys our team every two weeks just how things are going. These questions are developed by the Office Vibe team to assess for engagement and happiness and, and a number of different things at work. And that's really just to make sure that, you know, as we focus, we're focusing on the most important issues in the world and serving, I think, the most important industry in the world. Mm-hmm. And we can only do that if we're happy, healthy, maximizing our potentials at work. And so that's just a tool that really helps us make sure that we're doing that and also gives us really invaluable feedback about where the areas where we as a whole company can improve. So what would be your advice to a chief of staff who's listening to this and they're like, wow, this is a great idea and I should implement these tools. <laughs> and, and they're going to be making a pitch to their principals and to their team largely about 
doing this. And, you know, a lot of companies, I feel like most of the time they have performance reviews once a year and maybe maximum two, three times a year. So doing something like this could be a major shift in the already existing review process that an organization might have, whether they're a 30 person company or 200 person company. And a lot of people might think that this could be a really great way to have this consistent feedback loop and also create a culture of just honesty and transparency and being able to get honest and real feedback fairly often. And so what would be your advice to a chief of staff at a company who's like, I really want to implement this, but I'm not really sure how I would approach it because it would kind of mix things up a little bit in terms of the cadence. It's important to mention that we did have a review. We did have sort of like a biannual review process. And what we found was that it was really stressful for everybody. And it took up a lot of time and it got in the way of efficiency, quite frankly. You know, sort of this two to three week period where everybody was preparing for capital T, capital R, the review. It just kind of got in the way of what we really wanted to focus on, was, which was like improving as professionals. So we do have an end of the year moment in time where we meet with all of our team leads and, and go over salaries and promotions. But that is based on all of the reviews that have come before that through this, this platform. So it's actually a much quicker conversation and it's a much smoother process now. So what I would say is, you know, take a look around and talk to some people about how they feel about the review process. Is it positive for them? Do they feel as if they're getting regular coaching? And if not, you know, this is a really, really good way to, to help with that. And I would say also, you know, the future of work, everything I'm reading about professionals and what millennials and below are looking for at work is that they're not just looking to show up to a job. I mean, I think a lot of the listeners here will will know this and be familiar with this. Like people are no longer looking to just show up to a nine to five job and go home. Mm-hmm. They really want to be working at a place that values them as a whole human and allows them to bring their whole self to work. And I think regular coaching really helps with that. It helps the team member feel as if there's real investment in them as a person Mm -hmm. and it helps the team lead think about the difference between management and coaching, which I think is a really key difference not talked about often enough. And and any organization that's looking to attract the top talent, especially young talent, this is, this is the move, you know, this is the absolute right way to be thinking about investing in, in people as humans and allowing them to bring their full self to work. If you're thinking about diversity and inclusion and the importance of making sure that your workforce is really bringing you the best and the brightest that they possibly can, investment is done as a person regularly is really key to that. It's important to get real data from the people that are there about what they enjoy and what they don't like about the review process. But it's also important to think about, you know, how do you keep your company at the cutting edge of Mm -hmm. hiring the best and brightest brightest talent? And I think this is one of the ways you can do that. I feel like people are going to use this exact recording to bring to the meeting when they meet with their CEO and say, this is why we need to do this. That was great. (laughs) Um, Yeah. No, that was very helpful to hear that. And I think a lot of people, they have the intention of implementing these things, but they're not really quite sure what the right tools to engage with are and really how to talk to their broader team about it. So that was very helpful. In terms of just wrapping up here, Margaret, I always try to ask chiefs of staff, you know, you've been a chief of staff now for five years and you have seen a lot of growth. You've seen a lot of personal growth within yourself. So what would you tell yourself? the person that was first starting out in the role five years ago as you look back on this journey? Really good question and a tough one because I think that, I think it would be easy to say, like, take yourself less seriously or, <laughs> you know, enjoy the, enjoy the ride, which I think is great advice for anyone. But I think that everything I did, every mistake I made leading up to this moment really has taught me so much. So I'm not sure I would say anything to take away from that. But, you know, something that I've, I've learned a little bit more now is that I think that reaching out to other people and asking questions about what worked for them and what didn't work for them outside of your organization is really important. And I think that's a scary thing for people. I think it's scary for people to think about reaching out to someone they don't know and asking for time, especially the chief of staff, because you are busy for them. Most people, you know, probably all your friends, and you know what it means to give away 30 minutes of your time. But I think that Learning from other people, especially other people that you see yourself in, you know, for me, like other women, other people in the communities that I'm a part of, I think I wish I'd reached out to them a little bit more to learn from 
their wisdom and their advice in the role because I've done that more now and it's been invaluable. There are some people in the chief of staff community, especially women who have spent more time with me than I could possibly have asked for and have given me advice that I think will serve me for the rest of my my time. And I would also say reach out to people who are doing interesting things. I mean, some of the best advice mm-hmm. I've gotten is from my friends who are doing totally different things, but who I've been able to be open with about the, the different things going on at work and who have an interesting insights. So I think reaching out more both to people you see yourself in and also mm-hmm. to those around you who might not be in your industry, but who could give you different ways of looking at things is really important. And it's something worth pushing yourself to do. Well, Margaret, thanks so much for sharing all your wisdom. This was very, very helpful for me personally, and therefore I know it will be helpful for a lot of other people listening to this too, especially on the just accountability and and really thinking about your own success as a chief of staff and what that means for the rest of the organization as well as with your principals. So thank you so much for joining us and sharing all of your, your experiences. Oh, thank you so much, Caroline. I always love chatting with you and I'm so grateful to the Prime community. I mean, if you're looking for the best and the brightest chiefs of staff go no further, right? So thank you so much.